Hello, my name is Dr. Stephen McVeigh and I am a consultant paediatric intensivist working in Belfast and I am going to continue our case looking primarily at the management of the child post-cardiac arrest and of the post-cardiac arrest syndrome. So a summary of our case to date and with a referral made to PICU at this point. We have a two-year-old boy who has suffered an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. He was found submerged in a pond with potentially up to 35 minutes of downtime prior to the onset of CPR. He received 30 minutes of CPR whilst en route to the emergency department and when he arrived in the emergency department he was intubated, ventilated, actively rewarmed and received two further rounds of CPR before return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC. At the time of PICU referral, he had a size 4 cuffed ET tube in orally at 13 centimetres. He was on the department's transport ventilator, receiving tidal volumes of 7 mils per kilo, pulling pressures of 28 over 8 to achieve this. He had a respiratory rate of 25 and was in 60% oxygen. His saturations were 93% and he had coarse crepitations throughout his chest. His capillary gas showed a pH of 7.02, pCO2, which was high, at 6.8, a base excess of minus 18 with a lactate of 14. His chest x-ray showed his ET tube was at an appropriate position at T2 and that he had bilateral lung infiltrates. His heart rate was 128 and his MAP was low at 45, with a prolonged capillary refill time of 4 seconds centrally. His pupils were large, but they were now reactive, albeit sluggishly. His GCS was 3. His temperature has now risen uh, and is recorded at 32.2 degrees C centrally. And he has an IO in with no other IV access. So, cardiac arrest from drowning in children. If you look at the literature, drowning is a common cause of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in children. Depending on the series, it may account for 25-31% to 31 of cases. Various series report variable survival rates from 9% up to 46%. A worse outcome is seen generally if the child is subjected to a longer submersion time or requires a longer duration of CPR prior to ROSC. And in general, the majority who receive over 30 minutes of CPR and then survive to one year do so with a poor neurological outcome. The THAPCA studies were large, multi-centred, randomised control trials carried out in the setting of paediatric cardiac arrest. They assessed both in-hospital and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest for the use of therapeutic hypothermia versus normothermia. Of the out-of-hospital cardiac arrests identified in the THAPCA study, 25% of cases were due to drowning. The survival for such cases in this large multi-centred randomised control trial was 46.4% at one year. And at one year, 24.6% of survivors had a favourable neurological outcome. Unfortunately, published data to date isn't sufficient to guide optimal management specific to the child who has suffered a cardiac arrest secondary to drowning. As such, clinicians are advised to follow general guidance for managing the post-cardiac arrest syndrome. Post-cardiac arrest syndrome is a syndrome with four major components which results from a global hypoxic injury to the body followed by reperfusion injury with the formation of free radicals. The major systems impacted by the post-cardiac arrest syndrome include the brain and neurological system, the heart and cardiovascular system, the other two major components are the generalised ischemia and reperfusion injury to the remainder of the body systems and a component consisting of the pathophysiology which resulted in the cardiac arrest which may be persistent. These components define our management priorities when looking after children post cardiac arrest. Management of the paediatric cardiac post-cardiac arrest syndrome must begin promptly after ROSC. Typical indications for starting this management include the requirement for CPR for more than a minute in combination with a persistent comatose state post-ROSC or a requirement for mechanical ventilation post-ROSC. 
contraindications to ongoing intensive care management and post-cardiac arrest syndrome management include the presence of an advanced care directive advising or necessitating an avoidance of intensive care management. When aggressive neurocritical care is deemed not appropriate at a consultant level, the management of the post-cardiac arrest syndrome requires a coordinated effort, systematic approach and integrated approach. I have combined the early and the intermediate management of the post-cardiac arrest patient in the coming slides. This covers the first 72 hours of the post-ROSC time interval. The Airway and breathing management of the patient post-cardiac arrest necessitates securement of the airway. If this hasn't been done during CPR, then this should be secured as soon as possible post-ROSC. If anaesthetic agents are required in order to secure the airway, then I would advise using as cardiostable an induction as possible, probably with reduced dose ketamine as an induction agent and rock uranium as the muscle relaxant of choice. I would advise against the placement of a nasal ET tube as post cardiac arrest coagulopathy is frequent and a major epistaxis may significantly compromise ongoing management of these cases. I would also advise against electively changing from an oral to a nasal tube early in the post-cardiac arrest course as this risks loss of the airway and re-arrest and also will detract from time spent managing other aspects of the child's case as we're going to come on to. I would advise for a cuff tube in all cases as these children are likely to develop an acute respiratory distress syndrome pattern necessitating significant ventilatory pressures and if an uncuffed tube is used significant leak may compromise ventilation and require an ET tube change in its suboptimal position. Otherwise, the airway is managed as per standard paediatric intensive care policies, including monitoring of cuff pressure and confirming of position on a chest x-ray. As I've alluded to, children post-cardiac arrest are at high risk of developing acute lung injury or paediatric ARDS. This is a combination of a reperfusion injury to the lungs and of aspiration. And management in these settings requires achievement of certain goals with avoidance of injuring the lung further. The key goals to achieve are normal capnia and avoidance of hypoxia. Both of these goals are significant targets for adequate neuroprotection and therefore must be achieved. With regards to ventilation, normal capnia is targeted with a PaCO2 of 4.5 to 5.5 to avoid either excessive cerebral blood flow or excessively restrictive cerebral blood flow. The times when you would deviate from this target would be in situations where the patient is known to have a chronically high PaCO2 when normal PaCO2s for that patient are targeted. In order to achieve normal capnia, a ventilation approach is taken which avoids ventilator associated lung injury. This approach should be that in keeping with the management of paediatric ARDS, namely low tidal volumes, limitation of plateau pressure, titration of optimal PEEP and avoidance of high levels of FiO2. The respiratory rate of the ventilator can be used to increase the minute volume and manage the CO2. In addition to this, placement of an NG tube to decompress the stomach and avoid an overinflated stomach compressing and splinting the diaphragm is important. Adequate oxygenation is key and avoidance of hypoxia to avoid secondary cerebral injury. Targeting of saturations of 94 to 98% is a reasonable approach um, unless the patient has chronic cyanotic congenital heart disease, in which case um, targeting normal saturations for the child is adequate. In adults, hyperoxia has been shown to increase mortality post cardiac arrest and should be avoided. From a cardiovascular perspective, these children behave similar to a severe sepsis. They generally develop a low cardiac output state and as a compensatory mechanism, 
raise their systemic vascular resistance through vasoconstriction. The low cardiac output state is secondary to a reperfusion injury to the heart resulting in tissue edema of the myocardium. This results in a global stun with reduced contractility and reduced cardiac output. Onset of this dysfunction is early, within approximately 30 minutes of return of spontaneous circulation, and the nadir occurs approximately 8 hours post-ROSC. The situation generally lasts for up to 48 hours, and recovery to near normal function should be expected. During this period, our goals are to ensure that the body systems receive adequate oxygen through adequate effective end organ perfusion. A major target is the avoidance of hypotension, which is associated with increased mortality and morbidity in these cases. In order to guide optimal cardiovascular management, the patient would ideally have an arterial line, a central venous line and a urinary catheter inserted. On inserting the, the IV lines, baseline blood should be sent as listed on the slide. This will allow multimodal monitoring of the patient, including clinical parameters such as heart rate, BP and perfusion. Urinary output can also be monitored, as well as investigatory parameters such as lactate and the clearance of lactate and the mixed venous saturations. In addition to these monitoring modalities. A 12 lead ECG is useful in order to assess for any arrhythmia and a bedside echocardiogram if local skills allow is useful to assess for the degree of left ventricular dysfunction. Management of these children requires careful optimization of preload, contractility and afterload. Preload can be optimised with judicious use of small aliqua boluses of crystalloid fluids, monitoring the effect clinically after each bolus to avoid fluid overload. Once euvolemia is obtained, cardiac contractility can be aided with the addition of low-dose adrenaline, which can be started peripherally prior to central venous catheter insertion. Adrenaline at low dose is a good choice as it has predominantly beta effects resulting in increased cardiac contractility and increased heart rate with avoidance of the alpha effects of increased vasoconstriction which will increase the afterload on the heart. Often this is enough to stabilise the cardiovascular system early and with time the PICU team will consider adding in additional agents such as inodilators, including milrinone or dobutamine, if the BP allows. Pure vasoconstrictors, such as vasopressin and noradrenaline, should be avoided as these elevate afterload um, and increase the strain on the left ventricle, but hypotension should be avoided at all costs. Hypotension in the first six hours post ROSC was associated with reduced odds of survival in the Thapka multi center randomized control trials and therefore a key treatment target is avoidance of hypotension. If in doubt, early consultation with the local PICU consultant or retrieval consultant in order to help guide the management of vasoactive agents is indicated. The cardiovascular system can be further optimised by optimising oxygen carrying capacity of the blood with consideration for red cell transfusion and any arrhythmia should be treated in line with um, APLS guidance. Generally, we are aiming to normalise perfusion at the bedside of the patient, no achieve a normal beat blood pressure for the patient, aiming for around the 50th centile. I've included some examples by age on the slide. And we should hopefully see that the child will begin making urine and that their lactate will begin to fall. From a neurological perspective, we are aiming for strict neuroprotection in these cases. The brain will have been hypoperfused, will have undergone a hypoxic ischemic insult, and then a reperfusion injury. This will have resulted in cellular loss and apoptosis, loss of cerebrovascular autoregulation, and developing cerebral edema. Neuroprotective measures that should be instigated in all cases include nursing the patient in the head up position at 30 degrees and the head in the midline, 
avoidance of hypoxia and hypercarbia, as we've already discussed, and maintenance of inadequate mean arterial pressure and avoidance of hypotension, as already discussed. Addition of sedation should be considered in order to uh, reduce cerebral metabolic demand, and common agents used in paediatrics include the combination of morphine and midazolam. Paralysis with neuromuscular blockers can be considered, but if possible, avoided. And where available, monitoring should be instigated to identify seizures early using EEG, CFAM or compressed spectral array monitoring where possible. Early neuroimaging with CT should be carried out to rule out um, major neurosurgical or catastrophic pathology. The post-cardiac arrest syndrome patient has a high incidence of pyrexia or hyperthermia in the hours post-ROSC. Hyperthermia, even a single episode of fever greater than 38, is strongly associated with a poor neurological outcome. And this was the major driver which resulted in the FAPCA studies being carried out to evaluate mild hypothermia of 33 to 34 degrees versus normothermia in the post-cardiac arrest population. These studies showed no benefit of mild hypothermia over normothermia, and for the most part, paediatric intensive care units now target a normothermic goal for their post-cardiac arrest syndrome patients. This normothermia needs to be actively and aggressively maintained through the use of servo-controlled mechanisms and devices which monitor core pressure and either cool or warm the patient to maintain normothermia. However, we are often faced with patients post-cardiac arrest who are cold, and in particular in this case of a child suffering a drowning episode who is hypothermic. Often these children are actively warmed, but care needs to be taken to avoid overshooting and resulting pyrexia in these children, given the strong association of pyrexia with poor outcome. To this end, I would suggest that active warming is indicated if the child's temperature is below 32 degrees C, and once the child's temperature is above 32 degrees C, then passive rewarming can be used until normothermia, 36 to 37 degrees C, is obtained. Once normothermia is obtained, then active normothermia via servo-controlled mechanisms should be used to maintain this goal. Often, as I've said, the fe fever occurs post-ROSC, so the servo-controlled mechanisms generally cool the child to maintain active normothermia. Shivering is common in this situation, and to avoid this, adequate sedation with morphine and midazolam with potential addition of muscle relaxants can be used to avoid the increased metabolic demand of shivering. Muscle relaxants, however, should be avoided if at all possible. The reason for this is that it obscures any clinical seizure activity. Seizures increase cerebral metabolic demand and result in impairment of our neuroprotective goals. Therefore, we in the post-cardiac arrest syndrome patient institute continuous monitoring for seizures via EEG, CFAM or CSA modalities and treat seizures aggressively if they develop. Seizures are generally treated in lines with APLS guidance using benzodiazepines, Keppra. Phenytoin can be considered, but with newer guidance coming out that Keppra is as effective as phenytoin and phenytoin carrying a higher risk of arrhythmia, Keppra may be preferred. And I would also caution against the use of thiopentone, which appears commonly in persistent seizure algorithms given its propensity to drop blood pressure. And the epileptic drug prophylaxis generally isn't, isn't indicated, but can be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis in line with local policy. Other systems also take a hypoxic ischemic insult. For example, the bile is often underperfused, and this may be added to by the use of vasoactive drugs. In general, for the first 24 hours post-ROSC, the gut is protected by remaining nil by mouth with or without the addition of a proton pump inhibitor, and then Enteral feeds are started with caution after 24 hours. In order to prevent against dehydration and hypoglycemia, isotonic IV fluids are started at two-thirds to 80% of maintenance levels 
and dextrose is added at an appropriate percentage for the age of the child to prevent hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia are both associated with worse outcomes post-cardiac arrest. We therefore need to target normal glycemia. Moderate control is adequate as tight control is more commonly associated with hypoglycemia, allowing blood glucoses to be between 6 and 10 millimoles per litre. No definite threshold for therapy exists, but insulin should be considered if blood glucose is persistently greater than 10 to 12 millimoles per litre. Electrolyte derangement should be corrected and monitored. Generally, we keep the sodium at the higher end of normal to protect against the effects of hyponatremia on cerebral edema, and we generally aim to keep the potassium, calcium and magnesium at the upper end of normal to protect against arrhythmiogenic risks with hypokalemia, hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia. There is no evidence for the addition of hydrocortisone post-cardiac arrest syndrome unless there is refractory hypotension requiring two or more vasoactive agents. Acute kidney injury is common post-cardiac arrest, but there is no specific evidence for renal replacement therapy in this population, and the indications for instituting renal replacement therapy are the same as for other critically ill children. In addition, if an infectious etiology for the cardiac arrest is suspected, then culture should be sent, broad-spectrum antibiotics should be started pending the culture results. There is not any clear indication for prophylactic antibiotics post-cardiac arrest. Coagulopathy is common post-cardiac arrest and general PICU thresholds for optimization of coagulation, platelet levels and haemoglobin are indicated. In our case, the boy was transferred to PICU from the emergency department. Prior to transfer, his ventilator rate was increased to achieve normal capnia. An adrenaline infusion was started initially peripherally and then transferred to the central line once this was inserted. With the adrenaline infusion, his mean arterial pressure rose from 45 to 60 within the target range for his age. Urinary catheter was inserted and an arterial line was inserted and we saw over the next 12 hours an improvement in urine output and a slow clearance in his lactate levels. He was allowed to passively rewarm from 32.2 degrees in ED to 36 degrees and then active normothermia was maintained. Cultures were sent from his blood and from a blind bronchoalveolar lavage specimen and he did undergo a CT brain which showed no neurosurgical cause for his collapse resulting in the fall into the pond. Over the next 48 hours, his ventilation actually remained relatively stable, achieving the goals of normal capnia and normoxia within um, safe ventilatory parameters. He did develop some gasping, spontaneous efforts on the ventilator, and he had a cough, but no gag at this point. Echocardiogram on admission showed a moderately impaired left ventricular function, which resolved by echo at 36 hours, which was in keeping with the clinical picture where his mean arterial pressure improved and adrenaline had been weaned off by this point. An acute kidney injury did develop in this 48 hour window with a progressively positive fluid balance. This was managed with a, a frusamide infusion and no need for additional renal replacement therapy was required. Transaminases were elevated and a mild coagulopathy was seen on his bloods. He did not develop any sign of overt bleeding and the coagulopathy corrected with IV vitamin K. Cultures from the blind bronchoalveolar lavage grew a Klebsiella species which was sensitive to ceftriaxone onto which he was started. From a neurological perspective, his pupils were a size 2 and reactive. He had some extensor posturing to suction and no signs of any seizure. He was sedated with a combination of morphine and midazolam. I am now going to move on to give an insight into our later management of the child post-cardiac arrest. Generally, this is after 72 hours post-ROSC. And in general, we continue our management up until this point and we start then to make um, a more prognostic view of the patient. It must be said, however, that in the first 72 hours, if it becomes clear that the patient may have already died, and in that I mean by 
death by neurological criteria or brain stem death as it used to be termed, then appropriate assessment for this should not be postponed. Otherwise, neuroprognostication should be postponed until 72 hours post ROSC. In order to avoid clouding of the assessment, all neuromuscular blocking agents should have been stopped and allowed to wear off, and sedation should have been reduced to a minimum level for approximately 12 hours prior to assessment. The neuroprognostic assessment is a multimodal assessment, often carried out in combination with a paediatric neurology specialist. It involves a full neurological examination, an EEG and an MRI. The timing of the MRI is important. Changes on diffusion imaging peak between day 3 and 5 post ROSC. Prior to day 3, false negatives may be obtained as lesions have not yet developed and after a week these lesions may disappear on imaging due to pseudo-normalisation. As such, an MRI is often conducted between days 3 and day 7 post ROSC. Indeed, a normal MRI with normal DWI at three days post ROSC is associated with a good prognosis. With the findings of our neuroprognostication, we then decide what approach to take. Options are that we relax neuroprotective measures, wake our patient up, wean them off the ventilator, extubate them and move them on towards rehabilitation. In more borderline cases, we may continue the neuroprotective protective measures for, for a few further days and then reassess. It may become clear that a very poor outcome is likely, in which case difficult discussions and shared decision making with the family with regards to reorientation of care may be indicated. And finally, it may become apparent as time passes that the patient may have already died by neurological criteria, in which case formal assessment is warranted. So what happened in our case? Well, sedation was weaned and stopped. He was breathing spontaneously on the ventilator. Pupils were equal and reactive. He had a good cough, but a weak gag, and he had abnormal posturing to painful stimuli. His EEG was abnormal, and his MRI showed widespread infarcts in the cortex, the thalamus, and the basal ganglia. His parents were counseled regarding the poor prognosis and likelihood of severe disability. However, no agreement could be reached with regards to any limitation of his care or reorientation of his care. He was extubated to high flow nasal cannula oxygen but required re-intubation 24 hours later because of hypoxia, likely secondary to poor secretion clearance or aspiration. In the four days following this, he was treated with antibiotics but no positive cultures were obtained. He was weaned down onto minimal settings started on TNJ feeds and re receiving regular chest physio in combination with glycoperonium in order to manage secretions. With this combination he was successfully extubated to mask BiPAP which was gradually weaned over the next week to nasal cannula oxygen. He was discharged to the ward requiring three times a day physiotherapy and NJ feeds. So in conclusion, I just wanted to highlight what I feel are my key messages for managing the child post-cardiac arrest. Post-cardiac arrest syndrome is a multi-system disorder requiring multi-organ support. One of the major systems impacted is the cardiovascular system with impairment of left ventricular function. Early hypotension has a significant impact in morbidity and mortality and therefore I would suggest early support of these children with low dose adrenaline started peripherally in order to prevent hypotension. I would caution against electively changing an oral to a nasal tube early in the course of these children. First, it risks a chance of re-arrest if the tube does not pass easily. Secondary, these children are often coagulopathic and the changing to a nasal tube risks an epistaxis, which may be poorly tolerated. And finally, there are lots of other things that need to be sorted and need to be done in stabilising these children and time may be better spent sorting these aspects out first. The majority of management of these children is preventing secondary injury and to that end, avoidance must be made of hypoxia hyper and hypocapnia, hypotension and hypoglycemia.
with targets of saturations of 94 to 98%, target PaCO2 of 4.5 to 5.5, target MAP at the 50th centile for age, and target glucose between 6 and 10. Finally, hyperthermia is incredibly common post ROSC. Actively rewarming these children risks an overshoot. So once the temperature above 32 degrees is obtained, I would advise that you allow the patient to passively rewarm from this point and then institute an active normothermia mechanism once normothermia is reached. Thank you for your time.